Hey, welcome everybody. I'm John Zadar. This is On Top and Hot, and this is the weekend of May 5th. We are going to be looking at a hot OTC and penny stock today, as we always do. Today, we are focusing in on ticker BIXT, Bioxytran. This is a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that has a lot of drugs that they're working on, but two of their candidates are getting a lot of attention right now. They have one drug, uh, BXT-25. This addresses hypoxia in humans. That is to say, tissue cells that aren't getting enough oxygen are getting the oxygen that they need. This is great for stroke victims and serious wounds. Their other drug comes from Pharmalectin, their subsidiary. It is Prolectin M. This is being used to help our immunity systems, and it can be used on a lot of different viruses and diseases. There's a lot of information out there, but they are focused right now on neutralizing COVID. And it is not over, folks. And today, we are joined by a special guest who is going to tell us more about these drugs and the company. This is Mike Sheik. Hello, Mike. How are you today? Hey, John. Nice to see you. It's good to be here. I'm glad to have you here. Haven't done an interview in a while, so I hope I get this right. I'm excited about the information I've been reading about your company. You're working with new types of drugs, these new molecules that are actually working well with people. I mean, as a matter of fact, why don't we jump into the first drug that really excited me? You just came out with phase two top line results for your prolectin drug. Isn't that right? Yeah, we, we came out with phase two results um, in COVID, and we showed 100% elimination of the virus in, in day seven. So basically, what does that mean? That means when you do the nasal swab, you're PCR negative on day seven. But that's not the real telling thing. It was in a randomized controlled trial, but we were 100% responders rate versus six. Honestly, John, that's not the real story. The real story is what happened on day three. Okay. okay? Because yeah. <clears throat> the mea culpa is, boy, we should have been doing um, uh, maybe a day one, a day two, and a day three instead of going out to day seven. We knew it worked well. Yeah, we I know it worked down here in this well. news press. You said you would have preferred if this trial had been done on an hourly rate instead of a daily rate because the improvement yes. to the people's health was that quickly noticeable. Correct. Yeah, you know, you're you're probably and we don't have any we have em empirical data or anecdotal data right. that this works with, you know, in less than a day. Um and in other words, you're, you're going to start to see the clinical benefit. And it kind of makes sense. Look, if you have 82% of the people PCR negative on day three, what does that mean? Well, you have to have a, 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 an alleviation of their symptoms a lot earlier. Right. Okay, so some of the some of the anecdotal reports that we have, you know, um, are basically show that. And I notice here, um, it says here, existing therapies target viral replication, which battles on the inside of the cell, interfering, interfering with replication. Our galactin antagonist helps keep the fight outside the cell, interfering with cell cellular activity. So you're not getting inside these cells and working complicated science. You're just working defensively, basically, correct? Um, yeah, you know. I'm a military guy, so let's let's use a military analogy. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. So, yeah. in military tactics, is it smart to just kind of open up the gates to your fortress and 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 let them in, and then and then have a kill zone? No, no. You know, I mean that's that's what that's what antivirals are doing, right? What yeah. we're saying is, before when they land on shore, let's just annihilate them there. They don't even get to the fortress. I mean, that's what our galactin antagonist does. It neutralizes the virus well before it has a chance to get anywhere near the cell. It, it does it in this uh, extracellular domain is what they call it. And what about the contagion afterwards? Are, can, can they still pass it or are they clean now? I mean, we don't have to worry about them passing it on because a lot of people have gotten vaccines for COVID then they get COVID again and they can still pass it on. Is that going to be a difference with yours? 
Yeah, let's first talk about what really contagion is. Contagion is honestly it's measured by the the nasal PCR. That's what that's what contagion is. All so right. the idea is when you don't have a high enough um, shedding uh, there, they can measure with something that's called CT values. Um, it's it's the PCR test. So when your when your levels aren't very high, you're considered non contagious, right? Okay. Right. So based off of that, day three, eighty-two percent were non-contagious. Now, what you really want to ask me is how does that stack up against Paxivid? Now, number one, this is not this is not an apples to apples comparison. Okay, right. It's, and and to, to tell you how fair it is, it's like it's like running a marathon, and and giving Paxivid a head start to mile twenty-five, and then clicking the gun. And having me run the race, it's not fair to me, right? Yeah, but let's right. see how we stack up. So, in um, and these are real world data. Is the real world data shows that um, it takes around uh, twenty days to just get thirty percent of the population of people with underlying medical conditions PCR um, negative. How long does it take for our drug to get people PCR positive on standard risk people? These are people with fully functional immune systems, right? Okay. Yeah. How long does it take with our drug? 82% three days. Now, Amazing. the question is, what does it take for an average person to recover? There's data on that. And I've looked at some data, some some peer reviewed articles, and you know, depending on what virus it is, but the the last one uh, for Omicron data was around uh, nine and a half days. You know, speaking of peer reviewed data, this article here, this was preprint. Yes. It's kind of like for our viewers, it's kind of like unaudited financials before the real financials come out. It's the yes, I agree. And this was given to the investors. We got first dibs on this information before the medical community got to see it. And the stock did jump 50%. Well, this came out later. I guess it came out in March, March 12th and March 25th. And I want you to tell us, I was looking over here and this peer review got a lot more attention than your everyday average peer review. Most peer reviews are like National Geographic magazines at the dentist. They just don't get a lot of attention. This one went off the charts. Can you tell me why the medical community is so interested in this? Actually, yes. The reason the medical community is interested is because look at our responders rate. This was peer reviewed data. Who's gonna believe on a preprint that you have a hundred percent responders rate in COVID. I mean, think about how many tens of billions of dollars were spent on COVID vaccines and treatment. I mean, you really have to come to the medical community with a peer review. So they're going to look at all your methods, this, that, the other thing. But mm -hmm. now why did this go? We had some medical influencers that looked at this and they started tweeting like crazy. And then, and then, then those guys started retweeting. We ended up. If you look, if you look at the statistics on that, if you want to drill down, what you'll find out is that there were like around a thousand plus retweets. And in terms of traffic, I think right now, and that's like at the end of the article. You can scroll down to the end of the article. You'll see that we were close to between eight to nine thousand. So we'll call it eighty five hundred. Yeah, well, um, eighty eight hundred people looked at our journal articles you go to any other journal article out there and you start looking at statistics you're gonna see 10 15 25 right. you're not gonna see ten thousand. i mean i'm sorry and that's why that score that you saw on there there's an independent scoring agency that that ranks journal articles do you know how high we ranked uh-uh you were in the 99th percentile so is there anybody else working with all the journal articles out there? We were in the 99th percentile. Don't believe me. Look at the statistics. So you've got a lot of attention coming from the medical community. Is yeah. the medical community working with Galactin? Are there any drugs out there yet with Galactin? 
No, there's no there's no galactin antagonists that are approved. They're oh. all experimental. All our drugs are still experimental. They're not they're not approved. So this but, one um, here came through phase two trial. So phase three is next, and phase three is to pit your drug up against your competitors. Well, if you don't have any competitors, we would presume this should get through phase three pretty quickly with a hundred percent efficacy in phase two. We w the one hundred percent. It depends on what the endpoint is, and we we kind of know the endpoint's pretty much going to be the same thing, which is um, a percentage of people that are PCR negative by X time frame, right? So that's that's what we're looking for. Um, given our past, remember, we ha not only had one, we had two um, uh, randomized clinical trials okay. that both showed the same thing, 100% responders rate, both. So we're pretty confident going into the phase three that we're gonna that we're gonna replicate those results. Actually, that is the definition of statistical um, significance. What's the chance that this res re result was of chance? It, it, there, there's like it's nil, right? Um, which is which is why we could which is why you can come to the conclusion that the drug actually works the way it says it works, or you so can make that claim. With phase three just around the corner now, and as I said, not having any competition to pit yourself up against, assuming everything goes as we expect, how long do you think it'll be before this could be on the market? We think, and we need money, first of all, and most biotechs, you know, that's, that's my claim, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> assuming, right. we had money, assuming we had the money to pursue this, Right now, we're, we have the money to pursue the a dose optimization study, which will inform the phase three. Um, but assuming we could start the phase three, um, you're looking at a five-day trial for phase three. And, be, and, and what's, what's my, what is uh, my main uh, variable? The main variable is how many people that I can get into the clinical trial. How quickly can I recruit patients? How long is a trial? You already know it's five days, and then right. there's a follow-up period, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's not a long trial. It's not like we're we're going after cancer or something like that. So right. a short trial, we should we should be able to be through it within three to six months, with it with an endpoint. So technically, we should be able to do it this year if we have the funding. Right, of course. Yes. I always got to have funding, but that's exciting okay. to hear of a very drug. exciting. Yeah. Now, now, no. One more caveat: we're doing this in India. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I hope I didn't let a whole bunch of people in the United States down. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. You know, but I'm we really are worried. still we, we're still pursuing an IND in the U.S. We but haven't we haven't given up matter. on it. As long as it's proved, as long as it works, I don't care if it's India, France, the United States. If somebody can come up with something that is knocking it down so it can't get back up, right. I'm all for it. And I'm sure if it gets approved in India, that just makes your chances of the FDA approval easier. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a really uh, large upsurge. Uh, I, I call it actually a wave in India happening right now. Oh, the COVID uprising. Yes, Yes, yeah. China too, these very heavily populated areas. So for anybody to think COVID is done and gone is silly. We're not wearing our masks. We're not staying six feet apart. It could hit us again. And your your product may not be trite. It may be exactly what we need when we need it the next time. And well, John, do you know XBB, that, that variant is here in the U.S. right now. Does this work on all COVID variants? That's a theory. Yes, we believe it's going to work because what happens is we attach to a place um, on the spike protein that that's that doesn't change from virus to virus. Right. I read that you, your mo molecules actually slap up against that damaging cell. And yeah, normally like like antibodies, <laughs> antibodies change all the time. Right. And it's the tip that changes. Right. And the antibodies uh, latch on to the tip. We our our docking point on the on the spike protein is actually on the side, and that's a conserved region. Mm -hmm. Now, is collecting? Are you planning on going 
further with it because I've read a lot of information that collecting can be used on Crohn's disease, asthma, cancer, even HIV. Am I understanding this correctly that collecting's got a lot of possibilities <laughs> that the medical community knows already and just hasn't pursued? John, there's the there's this uh, there's a slide on my presentation, and it goes like, you do okay. I I, is is it that it's one? A, it's an alphabet. It's it's collectins for and an alphabet of diseases, right? So you if you oh there you you got it right. So <laughs> so what we should do? Do you want to do you want to play around with the collect? You want to take my collectin challenge? You want to try to stump me? Okay. All right. Uh, so what we do, look at all the diseases there, asthma, a cancer, um, diabetes, endometriosis, fibrosis, um, HIV, hmm, that's an interesting one, right. and, and liver fibrosis, NASH, that, that was like before COVID, that was the, the largest epidemic. You know, it just keeps going on and on. So what you do is take one of those, they're, they're, these are chronic diseases, right? Right. Go to Google, put the chronic disease in, followed by Galactin 3. All right. And, see, and when we play this Galactin challenge, we are going to see how big this really is. Crohn's disease, right? Galactin yeah, 3. I got Crohn's disease. First one I could spell easy enough. Galactin 3. So we're looking to see if there's any bowel disease. Look at this. Do you see, Galactin-3 plays an important inflammatory role right there. See Oxford Press? You just, yeah, right there. Yeah. You see, serum Galactin-3 is potential biomarkers. Galactin-3, oh, no, Galactin-1 expression in, in intestinal inflammation. Diabetes, there you go. Emerging role, Galactin-3, serum Galactin-3, overexpression. I mean, do you see all these? Do you see? Do you see what I'm talking about? All these yeah. journal articles. Yeah. But look at that last one: Galactin three as a prognostic biomarker for diabetic. Blah blah blah. I don't know what it is. <laughs> now you said this will work on long COVID as well, because I know we've got these vaccinations. But honestly, I never took the vaccination, and I'm kind of happy now because I've heard of injuries from these vaccinations, not just for adults, but for kids too. So we still really do need something to take care of COVID and not hurt the people taking the medicine. Right. So um, look, we'll address vaccine injury and then long COVID. Okay. So vaccine injury is something that happens when you, when you're getting the vaccination, what they're doing is they're trying to stimulate your body's production of these antibodies. Okay. That's, that's all that they're doing. And then right. what happens is you, you're having a reaction to those antibodies. For some reason, your body just can't clear these, these, um, or these, they can't clear these antibodies out of your system, or it's not really the antibodies. You're trying to make antibodies. It's the spike proteins that they make. Right. So right. I, I apologize for that. What they do is they introduce something that they, they turn. So vaccines, they turn you into a bioreactor to make spike proteins. You're the bioreactor instead of doing it somewhere else. And then what you're doing is you're creating these antibodies, right? So, but the problem is from the vaccine injury is that happened is the vaccine spurred the creation of these spike proteins. And you're supposed to be making antibodies, but for some reason or not, your body just can't seem to clear these spike proteins that were made. Right. And, 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 and that is the really dumbed down version of vaccine injury. So let's say hypothetically our molecule comes in there and what does it do? It's going to bind to the spike protein and flush it out of the system. That's simple. It's going to neutralize that spike protein so it's no longer irritating your body. And eventually, it flushes it out of the body. That's how we. That's how we believe we can um, attack this vaccine injury. Now, Good. long COVID. Long COVID is different. It is not a very. We we really don't know what causes long COVID. We have some theories. So let's let's look at the top theories. The number one top theory is viral persistence, or the shedding, or or these S one subunits that are just kind of out there. See, what happens is once the virus penetrates 
into the cell. It has like this ejection cartridge, like it's shooting a gun, and right. and this cartridge comes out, and that's the S1 subunit. So you have all these like cartridges laying around. So imagine you had a bunch of, uh, you know, in your office you had bullet sh casings all over your floor. It irritates you, right? Well, that's probably what it does to the body's right. immune system, right? So that's the theory of viral persistence. So we attach to the the spike protein, and we can say that with very um, uh, so with scientific certainty, because we did what's called an NMR study, and that was in that preprint that you uh, talked about. It's in there. It talks about all this, the NMR study, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, which basically shows with nuclear medicine, look, this attaches to that. Okay, which so we, is what all your medical community peers wanted to read. That's what they, yes. to me, it's just over my head. You might as well be talking <laughs> a different language on another planet. But I get the gist that we are close. We've got something that's going to help a problem that is not gone, even though it's gotten quiet. And it's nice to have hope out there. And I really yes. like the fact that this is a pro drug, that there are no side effects that you have noticed coming from the application of using this. And why is that, John? Because w when you have a drug that interacts with the spike protein, I'm not going to the cell surface. I'm not interfering with the cell. I'm right. just kind of out there in, in space. Building a fence. Seeing a virus and attaching it. And, and, I don't act and, and, and the, we don't activate the immune system either with, with this drug. Good. Good. We just neutralize the, the virus on contact. All right. I think we've gotten a good idea of this drug, and I'm excited about it. And I, I'm glad to hear that there's a very strong possibility that we could see this come to the end of phase three this year. So that's quite exciting. In India. <laughs> what was that? I said in India. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. The COVID in India is the same COVID we got here. So it's all yes, good. That's right. So I want to talk about your second drug, which also had some big news come out here recently. That is the, uh, this is BXT25. And this was yes. just tested in animals. And this is actually a molecule that carries oxygen around your body and delivers oxygen to tissue that is starving for oxygen and dying. So it keeps it alive and it's good for stroke victims and serious wounds and other things. Can you give us some more information about this? Because this one's interesting as well. Yeah, I can, I can tell you why it's important, but, um, I, I guess we'll, we'll, let's not get into the science. Let's just talk about the potential applications. Okay. okay yeah. So yeah. if you have a, let, let's talk, let's pick on the stroke patients, because if you have a stroke, you're going to be able to tell within 10 seconds that person has a stroke. It's that easy to detect a stroke. Yes. They have the yeah. fast acronym. Okay. So you're going to see a person that has a stroke almost immediately and what our, the concept behind our drug is it's going to take 15 minutes for the paramedic to get there right. to, to that patient. And then what happens, they're going to be, oh, wow, you're having a stroke. And what do they normally do? Okay, they take you to the ambulance, they put an IV vein in you right away, and they want to give you, they want to hydrate you because you're, you're basically in shock, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're going to transport you to the hospital. Now, why are they doing this? Is they're doing this because... They need to get imaging on you to figure out whether it's ischemic stroke, which means it's a clot, or if right. it's a hemorrhage. And you know what a hemorrhage is, the blood vessel yeah. burst. Okay? Yeah. It's just bleeding in your brain. That's not good. Yeah. But if you give TPA, which is for the clot, right away, so the paramedic gets it right away, and they give it to a person who has a hemorrhage, that person's absolutely going to die. Right. Absolutely right. going to die. That's why we have to... Um, have your brain hold its breath because that's what it's doing from when the paramedic sees you until when you get the imaging and you get the clearance to give the TPA drug. So our idea is this. You come in with the paramedic, you put the pick vein in, you give the BXT25, and then what happens? All of a sudden, this is theory. We don't know. We don't know if this is going to happen or not. But in theory, what happens is it's going to restore oxygen to the brain. And then what's going to happen, person's going to be like, wow, I feel better. 
no, ma'am, or no, sir, you have a stroke. We need to go to the hospital. I mean, that's that's what we hope is going to happen. We hope the person's going to get it and it's going to be like, no, 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 don't take me. I'm fine. No, you're not fine. You have a stroke and we need to find and we need we need to correct this situation. But that's 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 just to give you an idea of how we see it being used in stroke patients. It's this oxygen bridge between getting to the hospital and actually getting treatment. And on our web, on our uh, presentation, it's two and a half hours is the time to, to needle, time from when you get the stroke to actually when you get the, the TPA um, to get rid of the clot, if you have a clot. Wow. I remember we were talking about this and you explained the process and you said it's such a simple process the way we deliver the oxygen. It's just basic natural science, low pressure, high pressure. You got this yes. cell coming in with lots of oxygen creating a high pressure. It passes by a low pressure zone that doesn't have enough oxygen in the tissue. It just gravitates. You saw my video. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so what, this, what this is, it's, it's intravenous um, hyperbaric oxygen treatment. That's okay. what it is. Right, intravenous hyperoxygen. Right, I get intravenous that. hyperbaric oxygen treatment. That's basically what it is. Yeah, you don't Kinda need to call right? in a capsule. The capsule is put inside of you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because what it's doing is circulating your system over and over again. It picks up oxygen in your lungs and delivers it. Um, the key. The key. Um, I guess the special secret sauce behind it is it's so small. It goes into places that blood cells don't go, where the plasma goes, but the blood cell can't go because it's just mechanically um, uh, challenged, if you would. Now, is this in trials right now? No, it's in it's in preclinical trials. Okay, it's in preclinical trials. Yes, How soon do we really excited about what it can do. One. Again, that's the the magic question: <laughs> funding. <laughs> Right. This right. is um, this is um, uh, this is kind of on. Even though this is the most exciting thing that we have, this is this is on the back burner until we get um, through COVID. Uh, you know, uh, an approval for COVID. Because our right. idea is, hey, let's get COVID approved, and then let's do a, a label expansion, and we're hoping to get some nice licensing and royalty revenues off of this to um, continue our drug development uh, discovery. And now that's where that's where, that's where we revenue. get the funding. Are right? you planning on marketing these yourself? You were talking about royalties. Are you planning on licensing your products to the big pharmacies? Or are you planning on marketing them yourselves? Big pharma is one hundred percent our focus. Okay. We we're a very small team of people here. You know, half a dozen people. We we're not going to build this infrastructure to market the drug and and deliver it and do all that sort of stuff. No, absolutely not. That's okay. not our focus. We need big pharma. And we think so our drug as small pharma is to develop drugs that big pharma wants. Right. We think we have an incredible value proposition. Great. I think you do too. And uh, I've looked at a couple of other biotech pharmacies that are in the same boat. R&Ds need money. And without it, things get slowed up, trials slow up, and there's a lot of questions, obviously. But the potential, the potential for what I see here when you have no competition, when you're looking at drugs mo moving through quickly, and they're well, John, we, we, I want to correct you. We do have competition. All you right, know what our competition is? Competition and how you differentiate from them. Competition is the vaccine makers. I want you to think about it. The vaccine now. Now let me let me explain that. The vaccine makers. That's our biggest competition because there's this perception, perception that this is the way to go. They right. they threw they're they're throwing another five billion dollars at it to find a pan corona vaccine that operates on future variants. Right. Right. Um. I don't know. Maybe they should spend money on us to have to have a so you know I, I'm you know so that's our competition. So we're fighting we're fighting this 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 um uh, the this idea 
right. of that. You're really not fighting a company. You're fighting a conception that people think of back. That's it. We are better. fighting. We're fighting that conception. And so right now it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a, uh, I would call it hundreds of millions of Twitter hits versus my thousand. See the thousand hits. Right. So if we can continue to spread that message in the me medical community, then things are going to be more balanced. But right now, people remember people are saying that this is an that this is an endemic disease. Given what our drug does and how it re how it how it reduces the infectivity, this doesn't need to be endemic. I was looking at some statistics, mm -hmm. and what we found, and it was an article, and said, you know what? If we reduce the infectivity by, of this virus by masking, by social distancing, and if we just if we eliminated the they call it the R not by this amount, well then it would mean this much in savings. Well, they were talking about nine and a half days, and and the lowest, the most, the best case scenario was six and a half days, right? That was the best that they right. came up with. Where are we at right now? Three days, right? And it might be a, it might be even I don't know, it could be less than that. But mm -hmm. see, in, in terms of infectivity, so we aren't even, I mean, we're off the scale of, of people's concepts. We're not, even, we're not even a concept in their mind. They don't even understand that yet. So this was a major article that said, hey, if we can reduce infectivity, this is where we'll be. They, they, no one's thinking that it could be reduced to three days. Right. Right. We have peer-reviewed article that, di that disagrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But anyhow, that's the that's the thing is we this is a paradigm shift in the way of tr of in the way of treating disease. Um, now you asked me about the competition. Mm -hmm. We have some competition out there. There's okay. a company called Mole Molecular Partners, for example. You know they have this DARPIN technology, and they were they're in phase two, phase three, and they're backed by Novartis. But guess what? I I, I read through. And I want to see who my competition was. Sure, you do. They're not doing anything with COVID anymore. They, 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 they it's, it, it, they said that they're not, they're not pursuing it. I mean, that, that's their literature. I don't know if they are, or they're not. I'm just, oh. I'm just telling you what's in the public. They're not doing anything with it. And then uh, Parde's bioscience, um, that was, I mean, their mission statement. If you look at that company, their mission statement is to basically get rid of COVID and end this pandemic. Right. And with their drug and they had a they had a 3CO uh, protease inhibitor and they weren't able to show this difference in standard risk patients. And they basically scrapped their drug development. So they have a bunch of money sitting on their balance sheet. Right. And they scrapped this development um, of their of their drug. So, so you don't have any competitors anymore. They're all stepping out of the race. I don't know. Maybe they come back. Maybe COVID. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. But the, yeah. But th that's what it looks like. That's what it looks yeah, like. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with clearing the field voluntarily. I mean, whatever <laughs> works. Now, we're, we're, the, we're not giving up. <laughs> with all the peer review um, attention you're getting now, are you getting any attention from institutional investors? Any pharmaceutical companies or big companies looking at you right now? Yes, uh, let, let's talk about the the big pharma. Okay. Um, big pharma, um, we're talking to them, but I don't I don't know if they if it's registering with them. You know, they're they're they always come back with, look, we need to see more data. Well, the truth is, my message to big pharma is, why are you not working with us? Why don't you help us get this data? Um, and then we're also working with small pharma. These are companies with um, large balance sheets, possibly failed drugs, um, right. companies like that. You know, hey, partner up with us. I mean, let let's let's partner up because we both benefit by that. Yeah. Now I don't like asking this question, but I've got to ask it because I know every viewer is thinking it. Here in the OTC market, it has been rough over these last two years. I'm sure you're aware, Mike, that our volume on the OTC across the markets, really, but the OTC has suffered tremendously. A um, year and a half ago, we were at like 70 billion shares a day.
Right. We're down to 3.2 billion shares being sold. And lots of companies are doing reverse splits to keep their head above water. And many of us are getting wiped across the floor. So I got to ask you, Mike, straight up, do you guys have any plans on doing a reverse split? No. And the reason is we think the value is there right now. Um, when you, when you, yes, I know. Yes. Let's do the fist pump. We think the value is there. And we believe that we are at a value inflection point here soon. And we think that once we, we show, once we show people that we can raise money to execute our business plan, then I think the value inflection comes because at that point, what's to stop us? I mean, we have something, we have a five day trial for COVID. <laughs> Shortest trial it's I've ever heard of. This isn't, this isn't a couple of years for cancer. This is just, you know, and we've done it twice before. You know, there's the value. Bam. A quick clinical trial, very low risk on the science side of things. The biggest risk of this company is the ability to raise money. If we solve that, you show me where the risks are. So are you planning on uplisting the company? Yes, I, mean, I know we, everybody yeah, on that, your wants to go up, but do you really yeah, have to no. no, we've we've already explored that what it's going to take. Right. Um, we haven't we haven't we haven't engaged any attorneys in in that regard, but yeah, yes, we've definitely explored that. Um, we do have an investment banker, um, but in terms of uplisting, yes, we fully plan to uplist. When it's going to happen is really d based on the market environments and our ability to raise money. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, and you know we're SEC pipeline. John, you mentioned right away we were SEC reporting. So we're SEC reporting. Absolutely. The, the main thing that we need is we need the money on our balance sheet. We need that positive shareholder equity. We got to get rid of this debt. So um, yeah, once we once we're able to do that, show positive equity and have cash cash flow and burn rate going forward, there shouldn't be any issues. So where do you see the company, where you're standing right now, where do you see it going in the next year to two? What, what are your hopes, your, your aspirations to be? Yes, well, we, we, are, we want to license our technology. So we have two platform technologies and each, each platform has numerous indications, whether it's the glycovirology or the hypoxia and degenerative diseases. We have right. numerous um, uh, indications now the hypoxia and degenerative diseases, that technology is going to take a little bit long. So a couple years from now, you know, you can, you can ask me about that one. That's, okay. that's our baby. That's, that's the real, that's the real value of it. But uh, I see us as a licensing juggernaut. Okay. That's, 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 that's my opinion of it. Okay. Um, and we, we expect to be licensing a number of indications and filling up big pharma's holes in their pipeline. That's, that's where I see us, and, and I see a lot of diseases that we're going to tackle, a lot of diseases, especially viruses. That sounds exciting because, honestly, I don't like drugs. I don't like medications because they're chemicals, they're side effects, there's things we just don't know. And the medicines you're talking about, I don't even think of as medicines. You know, these pro-drugs are naturally working, as you said. High pressure, low pressure, moving oxygen. I mean, that's that's not a science we had to create. It's there's not going to be a side effect from it. I just not generally feel safer with products that you're creating over big pharma. Honestly, thank you. Yeah, well, it's the truth. So I am looking forward to this phase three thing because I am tired of COVID. I'm I'm not wearing a mask and I'm not standing six feet away from anybody anymore. But I still think about it. I know it's still yeah. out there. And I've been lucky so far, but how long can that last? So hopefully this comes out this year. I think the world needs it. And if it does, I think that will be some huge success for your company, Mike. Huge success. So is there anything that I haven't touched on to that you might want to share with the investors before we go? No, I think, I think you nailed it and encapsulated it. Just think about our future, mm -hmm. we can stop, we can change the paradigm of big pharma by right. investing, by supporting Bioxytran. 
this one little company, we see this uh, value inflection point happening uh, very soon. So just a little bit of publicity. And, and think about it, our peer review has only been out a month. Right. So that's why you have the chance. So what happens when we solve um, the other problem? What's the biggest risk in my, in, in my stock is, is our ability to finance. If we solve that and we have the medicine that we have, and we've shown that with the peer review journal articles, how long do you think the stock is going to stay down here? I don't know. I don't know is the answer, is the right answer. But my right. gut tells me we're at a value inflection point. With, with R&D, biopharmacies, biotechs, there is some time. You know, FDA's got to do their job. Tests have to be done. Things have to occur. But this is the time when the stock isn't being fully appreciated for its potential. Most of these R&D companies are under the radar. Um, people want to make instant money. Well, if you look down the road at what the potential of your company is, it's silly not to get a starter position right now to get something and get ready for it. I love what you're saying. And, and I did I, I'm, I'm, I did a little bit of homework. I want to tell you guys something. Okay. If you looked at all the COVID companies from their peak mm -hmm. to now, most of them are down over 90% from their peak. We have a long-term shareholder base that understands the value here. So once there's a little bit of volume and a little bit of activity, I think you're going to see um, you're going to see that value inflection point happen. Yeah, you, you're pulling up a chart. Yeah, B R X T. No, oh, B I X T. Thank you, my dementia. <laughs> All right, let's get this out. I of have here. a solution for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, more XT twenty five. I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah, low hanging. You let you let yourself open. All right, so your four hour chart. You had a high back here of a dollar twenty five. Hit a low of thirty six cents. Currently at forty five. On the four hour chart, you had that big bust on that news come out. Your face yeah, trials. Like, yeah. Do you, do you want to know what happened there? Or the theory there is that we had a we had a seller, and what happened is that that seller put, might have stacked some positions out there but then what happens when what happens when he was done selling it exploded you see yeah yeah about a hundred and uh, about a hundred and twenty percent jump that day nice right it got it got bid to it got bid to 105 or no bid bid one offered 105 i saw it and there's your hourly chart. You are riding right on top of that 200. I mean, it's precarious. It's waiting for an opportunity yes. to take off. This is what we're always looking for on our charts. You don't want to be too far away from the 200. And optimally, you want to be on top. And I've been watching yours for a while here. She has been positioning herself. But right. again, even if she doesn't run right now, not all stocks are meant to be day trades or short swings. There's a lot of companies. This isn't, yeah, this isn't a day trading stock, no. Right, right. It is a, a long trade that could be huge. I mean, you've got to have vision. And I think you've got a product here that's exciting because I don't think COVID's you. going away. I don't trust the vaccinations. We need something cleaner, safer. And I think you've got just that. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your time, Mike. I would gladly have you back on whenever you want to be here. I am always available. And folks, I want you to do some more research yourself. As always, we did not cover all the information about the company. So do some more due diligence. Do some research. You know what I always say. The more you know, the more you grow. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Mike. Thank you. See you guys.